Forensic Palynology. Palynology refers to the study of pollen and spores as evidence. Doesn't seem like pollen and spores is the type of thing that would be useful at most crime scenes. It's not like I'm going to kill you with hay fever or anything, but pollen is everywhere. Spores are everywhere. They are on surfaces. They're in the air. They can be very, very specific to regions, climates, and seasons. Um, you can have a certain species of tree that lives in the Pacific Northwest and will have off um, and will release pollen only in the Pacific Northwest, but not here. You might have a type of species of tree that lives well in the greater Boston area and south onto the Cape, but not so much in New Hampshire. Characterizing pollen, therefore, can go a long way towards linking a person or an object to a crime scene and sometimes at a point in time. Not everything is releasing pollen in great quantities all year long. Oftentimes this is seasonal. You have some kinds released in the spring and some in the fall, some only when it's hot and dry, some others when it's cooler and humid. Depending on what's around, you might be able to then also link these objects to the crime scene at a relatively specific point in time. Over half a million different species produce pollen or spores. Um, a, a ton of different plants, many types of fungi and ferns, mushrooms produce spores. There's a great variety of um, species that do this trick. And the spore and pollen morphology, the shape of the pollen and the spores, is specific to species. So you have all these different kinds of um, plants and fungi releasing spores and pollen into the atmosphere. Each one is specific to the species it came from. If you can look at the pollen and the spores, you can see what it came from. You know when that thing is releasing pollen and spores during the year, where it is, etc. You can look at what's embedded onto your evidence, and then you can maybe characterize the places that that piece of evidence might have come and gone. Pollen refers to the male gametophytes of seed-bearing plants. Basically, you have a shell with plant sperm inside of it. Male gametophytes of seed-bearing plants. The pollen's released into the atmosphere somehow. Either it's carried by wind or it's carried by some sort of insect or small animal like a, a bumblebee. That kind is usually pretty sticky. So it sticks to the small animal. The ones carried in the wind tend to not be super sticky. But these will go off into the world, eventually find their way into a plant. Don't ask me what the receiving part of the plant is. I'm not a plant person. And then it can be fertilized to make a seed. The picture over here is a common dandelion, which releases pollen. The little bits that you're used to seeing here that go flying through the air are your seeds, and that was created when a male gametophyte hit the inside of the flower into the female part and then ultimately created a seed. You can ensure a lot of genetic recombination this way by this random assortment of pollen. You just like spit your pollen out into the world. Wherever it happens to land, it lands. Sometimes that'll be into a totally unrelated female. The genes will crisscross mismatch. You get a new seed with this great um, shuffling of genes. This is a really successful reproductive um, uh, process. Spores where, are where you have the male and female gametes all in that same tough exterior shell. So you have some sperm, you have some eggs, you have a tough shell, it's going to be spewed out into the world, it'll land where it lands, and then when the conditions are right, that shell will break down, the gametes will combine, and you'll have a um, new, new creature. Algae does this, fungi does this, like this is a puffball mushroom. Mosses do this and ferns do this. If you go out for a walk and you see a fern, oh man, I am not an artist, and you look at the bottom, you'll often see these little circles. They make spores. Those little circles on the bottom side of ferns make spores. These spores may be windblown or they may be carried as well. They do not use the same terminology as with pollen. Common characteristics of pollen and spores include that they're always micro microscopic. You might see a cloud of them, but that's really a dense assembly of pollen or spores, not individual um, entities. They're produced by adult plants and fungi. Um, 
uh, uh, plants and fungi that are in um, more immature stages of development do not do this. They need to be fully sexually mature. They are dispersed by the millions in the springtime. You see those bright yellow window sills around because pollen is being produced in such high quantities that it lays down in thick mats. And they're both analyzable by a variety of microscopic techniques. Individual um, granules of pollen or spores are not visible to the naked eye. You can only detect them when they're in large quantities. Definitive analysis of either pollen or spores usually requires scanning electron microscopy. You may be able to characterize a type of pollen or a type of spore without using scanning electron microscopy by using a clever combination of microspectrophotometry or polarizing microscopy or compound in microscopy. Um, and you, you may be able to characterize that, but if you need to see something at a higher level of detail, the difference between this one type of pollen and a different one that you care about isn't able to be distinguished by these other means, then you're going to have to revert to scanning electron microscopy. This image right here is a pollen type under a regular compound microscope. You can sort of see some internal features and some external features. They have these little nodules on them and they also have little vacuoles in the middle, these little bubbles for digestion and whatnot on the inside with a compound microscope. You can't see this with the naked eye. You can see it under a compound light microscope. This is under a polarizing micro microscope, this next image right here, polarizing with fluorescence. This was compound over here. Some types of uh, um, um, organisms are automatically fluorescent. They sort of glow on their own. You can also induce some creatures to glow by injecting them with special genes or special dyes. If you do that, they'll be taken up by, in different ways by different types of um, pollen or different types of organisms. You put those wavelengths that that type of organism is emitting through a polarizing microscope and you can see some greater level of surface detail sometimes, and you can perhaps hope to characterize that pollen in a different way. This image over here is scanning electron microscope with added color. Remember all scanning electron microscopy is inherently black and white, um, but you oftentimes will add color after the fact so that you can distinguish different features better. With this, you can sort of see what's going on in all of those, those little holes and grids and stuff, but you can't see the extra stuff that's going on in between with any kind of clarity. So the scanning electron microscope was able to give you the degree of clarity and resolution needed to make a definitive characteristic of this pollen. Sometimes the first two methods suffice, other times not so much. Pollen can be characterized by its overall unique shape, so many of them are round and sort of spiky like we've seen so far. Others have this sort of like coffee bean appearance. Others are very small, maybe have a little cleave to them. Um, you might have some that have this sort of triangular overall shape. There's others that have a more irregular overall appearance. Each is going to be unique to the species it came from. You may need something like a scanning electron microscope, though, to be able to make out the very specific differences between closely related species. You can detect a uh, characterized pollen by its aperture type. So aside from its overall shape, they have these pores that let the gametes out. And overall surface ornamentation and sculpturing. Do they have little spikes? Do they have like a grid? Are they smooth? Do they have a cleave? Things like that. Handling pollen and spore evidence. Early collection for analysis is essential. Pollen blows around, spore blows around, it desiccates, it rubs off very, very, very easily. If you think that you're going to need to collect pollen or spore evidence, you need to do it right away. It's going to be one of the first things you do when looking at your individual piece of evidence. Analysis requires a specifically trained forensic palynologist. They're going to calculate the estimated production and dispersal patterns of pollen and spores, also known as pollen rain, in the environment at the time. They'll produce a pollen fingerprint of the location at that point in time, and then they'll compare the pollen burden on the evidential item 
with what the pollen in the atmosphere would have looked like at the time. If they match, they could perhaps link that piece of evidence to that, that, to that location. If they don't match, that can be an indicator that that piece of evidence was somewhere else at the time of the crime.